You're welcome to start. Have a good session. Thank you very much. So good morning or good evening. Uh, maybe maybe I'll let me let me start first. So, yeah, sure. uh, okay. So welcome everyone to the to the session on encryption schemes. Uh, my name is Willie Susilo from University of Wollongong, and I'll be co-chairing with uh, Kuang Nguyen from Nanyang Technological University. So we have six papers in this session. So we will require five minutes for presentation and then five minutes question. So the first talk is uh, public key generation with verifiable randomness. Uh, Olivier Plazy, Patrick Toa, Damien Fainu, and the speaker is Patrick Toa. Please. Thank you very much for the introductions and welcome to this talk. Um, so it's on public key but in generation with verifiable randomness and is based on joint work with Olivier Blasi and Damien Vanio. Um, most of this work was done while I was uh, at IBM Zurich and simultaneously with the student at ENS. So well, with that, we can start. And um, so my main observation uh, with this talk is that every crypto system basically starts by specifying the key generation algorithm and the security of um, of those public key crypto systems basically rely on the fact that the secret key remains hidden. And also that the secret key is generated with a uniform randomness usually. So it's usually assumed that the key generation uh, algorithm has access to uniform randomness. But in practice, um, true randomness, if it even exists, is really expensive. And it usually doesn't come in a single chunk and usually it's accumulated over time uh, in our computers in the CPUs. And um, actually there was, Already in 2012, uh, Lens trial did like a sanity check and found out that many RSA keys uh, on the internet share common primes. And later that year, it was shown that actually the reason was that there was low entropy at the time when the keys were generated. So this actually showed that in practice that there's a huge gap between theory and practice because in practice, actually, when the keys are generated, there's no access to, uh, to uniform randomness. And uh, the, the consequences of randomness failure were even shown to be more devastating in 2017 by the MKL, where basically they were able to recover uh, private keys from RSA public ones, uh, simply because the fraud implementation were using specific primes instead of uniformly random one of, the, of a certain size. And several devices were shown to be compromised in practice, like the device they're using the red wall. So, um, in 2002, already at PKC, uh, at PKC, Justin Quartardo already tried to address this problem, um, which to try to bridge the gap between theory and practice. And um, they consider basically a model in which a user here, Alice on the left, will be assumed not to have necessarily access to uniform randomness. But then there will be another authority, another party called Bob, and Bob's job will be to provide Alice with randomness so that they could together in a protocol generate a pair of keys. So Bob that the Alice ends up with a pair of public private keys, but Bob of, of course only knows um, the, the public key at the end. And the sources of randomness would also be uh, adversarial uh, in the model. So they try to address this, uh, this problem. And please note that um, here the goal is to certify Alice, the end user, so like me, that the keys that were generated with a computer were generated with high entropy randomness. So Bob's job is basically to help Alice, the, the end user, the, the human, to tell her, well, the keys that were generated with a computer are really were generated with high entropy randomness. Of course, Alice's computer could link the key in other ways. That's a different problem. What we are here trying to solve is just to make sure that at, le at least Alice's keys are not faulty and to make sure also that they are not vulnerable, vulnerable to these randomness failure attacks. And the requirements of such a protocol between Alice and Bob is first that if Alice has high entropy randomness, so Bob should have no information about the secret key. The second is that if Alice or Bob has high entropy randomness, then an external attacker could not infer any more information about the secret key than the attacker would have uh, with the public key generated with the, key gener the specified key generation algorithm. And the third one, which is really important here, is that if Bob has high entropy randomness, so Alice's computer should not be able to influence the key generation. So in particular, there should be no, the public key should not be used as a covered channel to convey information about the secret key. And uh, typically, um, this third property, which was not completely satisfied uh, uh, for the key generation algorithm um, of RSA keys, is basically what led to the ROCA attacks. So these are uh, attacks on RSA keys. 
simply because the public key was not chosen uniformly and then commit some information about the secret key. And even with the protocol of choosing Quadrado, which was of course not uh, put in practice uh, in 2002, the protocol for RSA keys still allowed for log lambda bit capacity uh, cover channel. And uh, this is basically the problem that we're trying to tackle. So of course the first two properties, but also make sure that the third one is also satisfied in such a protocol. And um, so in this paper, what we basically did was to first uh, provide a security model with concurrent sessions and almost no cover channel. So because in Jules and Guardado uh, paper, what they did, they were considering just a single session. Whereas for instance, um, these uh, vulnerability shown by Les Royale basically shows that there is shared corrected randomness across several sessions. So this was not taken into account and we actually have like a formal security model to basically um, guarantee that if a, pub if a public key generation protocol is uh, secure in our model, then uh, it also has almost no cover channel. We explain why there are certain cover channels that are unavoidable, but except for those, we actually show, we actually have a model which says, if the protocol is secure in this model, then there will be no other cover channel possible. And we also explain uh, under which circumstances these cover channels can be mitigated. We also give actually a protocol for all public key generation algorithms that can be modeled as probabilistic circuits. And uh, since also, for instance, the, there is no probabilistic circuit to generate primes unless you want to resolve a certain assumption. Uh, we also give actually an even efficient uh, instantiation uh, protocol basically to generate our keys because they're still used in practice. And uh, actually they're the most deployed with the ECDS keys. And we give an, uh, an efficient instantiation. And in this instantiation, we actually arrive at a problem of proving or arguing knowledge of double discrete logs. So this problem was introduced in 1997 in by uh, Stadler. And it was used to be verifiable uh, secret sharing scheme and also even later to build credential system by HSL and uh, eCache as well. And the only method, method uh, so far uh, uh, to prove this uh, double discrete log were in log of the order of the group. And now actually we managed to have an exponential decrease in the communication complexity for the prover, which is double discrete log groups. And uh, of course, we also uh, point out to further research directions. And I invite you to have a look at the complete talk um, for an overview or a more in-depth overview of the paper. And, also have a look at the paper and please send us an email if you have any questions or right now. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, do we have any short questions from the audience? We will also have a session for, for questions later on towards the end of the session for all the speakers. Okay. Uh, I will stop uh, sharing my screen right now. I have a short question, Patrick. So uh, sure. for the instantiation, you have the discrete log and also RSA. So is what, what about for the for the other type of uh, for for the for the other type of crypto system? So is there any big difference or is there any similarity or can you create some sort of like chain reconstruction? Okay, so the the the, the particularity of RSA keys is that you have to generate primes. So technically, you it's not just like discrete log where you have to take one uh, X in ZP at random and compute it to the X. What you have to do there is you have to like go through several uh, numbers of a certain bit length and test primality and test perhaps additional conditions. So, and also for RSA, you really wanna make sure that the primes that will compute your models are really the first two that you would find and so that you wouldn't choose specific primes. So I feel like these are very specific to the RSA key generation algorithm. But of course, like the technique that we use for all the probabilistic circuits could be used for standard key generation algorithms. But one thing I wouldn't know is like, for instance, what would happen if um, you would choose a key where it doesn't have like um, uniform distribution, for instance, right. if you want okay. to have like special properties. And this, if you can model this probabilistic circuit, then you can use our generic protocol but yep. it may not be the most efficient way in practice. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks Patrick. Mm -hmm.
All right, so uh, let's move on to the second uh, talk. So as I mentioned earlier, there will be a question session uh, at the end of the session for anyone who missed the question. This. So the second paper is a simulation sound arguments for LWE and applications to KDM CCA2 security. The authors are Benoit Liebert, Huang Nguyen, Alan Pesegu, Radu Titiu, and the speaker is uh, Radu. Please, Radu. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about uh, simulation sound arguments and some applications to key dependent message security. Um, the main result of this talk is a generic compiler that preserves languages. And in its simple form, it, um, just a second. Uh, I cannot see one of my slides. Yeah, oh, it's good. Uh, so uh, our main result is a generic compiler that preserves languages and in its uh, simple form, it, it takes as input a trapdoor sigma protocol and gives a multi-theorem non-interactive zero knowledge argument system, which achieves statistical zero knowledge in the common random string model. Uh, this basic construction can be upgraded uh, to take uh, as input a trapdoor sigma protocol and give an unbounded simulation sound on interactive zero knowledge argument system. Uh, the main feature features of our compiler uh, are that it preserves uh, languages uh, in the sense that our compiler does not uh, does not use um, our compiler uses the same language uh, as the starting Sigma protocol. Uh, another key feature is that the transformation is direct in the sense that it doesn't have to go through some expensive reductions to some MP complete language. Um, another point is that our, uh, our compiler uh, enjoys a tight security reduction in the unbounded simulation soundness case. And this means that the security loss of the reduction is independent of the number of queries that the adversary makes in the unbounded simulation soundness security game. And another feature is that we can instantiate our compiler under the standard LWE assumption. Uh, one point here that I have to make is that our results do not contradict the uh, impossibility results from the literature. And this happens because uh, our resulting NISACs are uh, either for trapdoor languages or do not, or, or only achieve non adaptive soundness. And as an application of our compiler, we can instantiate the Nauer Jung double encryption paradigm uh, under the standard LWE assumption in a direct manner. And this yields uh, the most efficient KDM CCA2 uh, secure public key encryption that we know so far. Uh, in a little more details, uh, until this work, the only way to achieve unbounded simulation soundness from trapdoor sigma protocols for specific languages of interest uh, would have to go through expensive reductions to some NP complete languages. Uh, for instance, one way to do this would be to use the Fiat Shamir transform and then use the OR trick of FLS and uh, combine this with the ideas from the Santis et al. paper, and this would yield an unbounded simulation soundness for the same language L that we have started with. The problem with this is that uh, these general techniques uh, require a reduction to some NP complete language L prime that is different from the uh, starting language L, and this can be very expensive. Instead, our compiler uh, works in a direct manner in the sense that it avoids expensive NP reductions to some NP complete languages. And 
Uh, as I've mentioned before, it enjoys type security in the unbounded simulation soundness case, and we also can instantiate our compiler under standard learning with errors assumption. The key components of our compiler uh, are uh, correlation intractable hash functions, equi equivocable lossy encryption, which uh, is a technique that has been used before by Damgard in Eurocrypt 2000. We also make use of admissible hash functions and one-time signatures. The key technical component that allows us to simulate multiple proofs is the lossy encryption part. And this is uh, our main technical or, or the main technical tool that uh, allows us to achieve this result. And uh, as an application of our compiler, we instantiate the Nauer Jung transformation under LWE assumption, and this yields a more efficient LWE based key dependent message secure public key encryption scheme against chosen ciphertext attacks. And to achieve this, we start with the primal Regev crypto system that has been proved to be KDM CPA secure under learning with errors. And our actual result is uh, construction of a trapdoor sigma protocol to prove that uh, this uh, primal Regev ciphertext encrypt the same message, that two primal Regev ciphertext encrypt the same message. And then we apply we can apply the compiler to get uh, unbounded simulation sound NISX. And uh, this allows us to apply the Nauer Jung transform to get KDM CCA2 encryption under the LWE assumption. And I have to mention that uh, KDM CCA2 public key encryption uh, was implied by previous results by the work of Pikert and Shen Yan, who proved that uh, NISX for MP languages are possible under the LW assumption. But our construction is more efficient in the sense that uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have to go through uh, reductions to some MP complete languages. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Radu. Do we have any questions from the audience? Let me just check the chat. All right, no question. Thank you very much, Radu, for the talk. Thanks. Okay, so we move on to the third uh, paper. It's a CCA secure puncturable CAMS from encryption with non negligible decryption errors. Uh, the authors are Valerio Cini, Sebastian Ramacher. Daniel Slamanik and Christoph uh, Strix. Uh, then the speaker is uh, Valerio Cini. Yeah. Valerio, please. Uh, yes, uh, so thanks for the introduction. So as Daniel suggests, in this work, we constructed a generic compiler to transform weakly secure PKE with a possible non-negligible decryption error into CCA secure CAM. And this is particularly important in the context of uh, post-quantum security, since uh, uh, most of the mathematical problems used there involve some kind of error correction, and therefore PKE built out of this assumption do not have perfect decryption. And recently it was shown that since the ability to correctly decrypt might depend on the secret key, failure to decrypt can leak information about it. So one uh, really should uh, aim for uh, a negligible correctness error in this context. The standard definition of uh, correctness error used in this work and also in most of the NIST uh, submissions to the post quantum competition is the one introduced uh, in TCC 17 by HHK, where one takes the maximum or possible message in the message case and thus obtain an upper bound on the decryption error of any single message. The idea behind our compiler can be summarized as follows. So we start from a CPA secure PKE with a possible non-negligible decryption error. And then by means of the compiler that we constructed, one reduces the decryption error to a negligible level, where by negligible we mean less than two to the minus one twenty-eight. 
Once the PKE has an negligible error, then one can apply a standard transformation to boost the security of the system. So we see that we need uh, uh, two, uh, two tools, one to decrease the error and one to boost the security. So as far as the first one is concerned, uh, we draw inspiration from the work of Dwarf et al. from European 4 where the error is reduced by encrypting the same message multiple times in parallel. Then during the decryption, one decrypts all the different ciphertext and runs a majority vote on the obtained plain text to decide which one to return. The need, uh, the necessity to rely on the majority vote causes the decryption error to not scale optimally with the number of repetitions used. So as one can see from this table, for example, when uh, two repetitions are used, one does not uh, improve the decryption error with respect to the one of the underlying PKE. Since as soon as one of the two ciphertext fails to decrypt, then one obtains two different plain texts, but has no way of checking which one, which one of the two is the correct one. The second tool we, we use is a generic transform to boost the security of the scheme. Uh, one such transformation is the so-called FO transform, which again in uh, TCC 17 by HHK, it was showed that it can take as input also a PKE with uh, an negligible correctness error. And moreover, they, they showed that this, this uh, transform can be seen as the composition of two more compact transformations. So what we did in our work is to integrate the idea of the work compiler on how to reduce the decryption error into the first of these two transformations. So we constructed a new transform that we denoted as T star. And then we showed that this new transformation can still fit into this modular framework. And therefore, on top of it, one can still apply this uh, unit bot transform to obtain a CCA secure cam. So more explicitly, um, given a PKE with decryption error delta, one computes L such that delta PDL is negligible. And then during the, the encryption, one encrypts L times in parallel with the same message. Using as randomness for each encryption, the output of a random oracle on input the message and the position on the overall ciphertext. In this way, one avoids a mix and match kind of attack. And moreover, since now the decryption, the, the encryption is the randomized, during the decryption, one can check the correctness of the obtained plain text by re-encrypting it and thus uh, getting rid of the majority vote. So now as soon as one of the ciphertext uh, correctly decrypts, one is able to return that the obtained plain text. After constructing the, uh, the compiler, we evaluated its performance on the NIST uh, round two submissions to the post-quantum competition. So what we did is we looked for submissions where both a CPA and a CCA version were available. We applied our compiler to the CPA version and compare efficiency and uh, and sizes of the obtained CAM with the ones of the CAM from the same submissions. So the results are quite good in the context of code based PKEs. So here we had two uh, submissions where we could apply our compiler, Bike and Rollo. And for Rollo, we obtained efficiency improvement uh, from uh, 39 to 80%, and size uh, reductions up to 27%. Whereas for bike, we obtain an interesting trade-off between runtime and uh, size. Uh, unfortunately, the results are not as good as for, uh, as uh, lex based PKEs are concerned. So it, also here we had two submissions where we could compare the results of the compiler. But for, uh, for example, for PhotoCam, we did not gain anything, neither for efficiency nor for size. And for round five, we only obtained a not very interesting trade-off between size and in the paper, uh, we also showed how the same ideas can be applied uh, to, to obtain a first candidate post-quantum CCA secure VFM. So VFM is a primitive recently proposed by Derler et al. in Group 18. However, in their work, they required a perfect decryption of the underlying building block, hence preventing post-quantum instantiations. We extended that work and we showed how one can generally reconstruct VFM from any I IDE, even uh, from ones with uh, non-negligible decryption error. Um, we, as far as further research direction are concerned, we would like to extend our analysis and in particular 
try to understand why there is such a strong difference between card and lattice based schemes. If this is only due to the particular schemes we analyze, or there is some underlying reason for such a difference. Thanks for your attention. Yep. Uh, thanks very much for the talk, Paradio. So, do we have any questions from the audience? So no questions for now. Uh, probably we will have a question at the end of uh, after all the talk uh, is done. So I'll uh, thank you, Valerio. So I'll hand over to Kwa for the next paper. Thanks, Kwa. Okay. So uh, thanks, Billy. So let's move to the fourth paper of the session. Uh, the title is "Possibility and Impossibility Results for Receiver Selective Opening Secure PKE in the Multi-Channel Setting." Uh, the authors are Ruben Yang, Chun Ju Lai. Cheng Kang Huang, Mang Huo, Chiu Lang Xu, and Willie Susilo. And Ruben will be the speaker. Ruben, please. Okay. Can you share your screen? Yeah. 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 Christmas screen? Yes. Please. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, the talk today is about public equipment schemes with receiver select token security in the multi-channel setting. So we are, all very, we are all very familiar with the notion of public inclusion. Generally, it consists of three algorithms, namely the key generation algorithm, which produces public key and secret pairs. The inclusion algorithm, which encrypts a message into a subtext, and the decryption algorithm, which decreases uh, the subtext into a message with a secret key. Its correctness requires that the decryption algorithm can always recover the encrypt a message from an honestly generated subtext, and this security requires that no one could learn anything from the subtext. Uh, in practice, uh, the PKE scheme is usually deployed in a multi-user setting. That is, there are many users with different public keys and secret keys, and the sender sends a message to a receiver by encrypting the message with the receiver's public key. So in this case, it's common that the, some receivers may be corrupted and their secret keys will be revealed to the adversary. And in this setting, it seems infeasible to protect messages that are sent to those corrupted receivers. But we still hope to protect messages that are sent to the uncorrupted receivers, especially when the corrupted messages and uncorrupted messages may be related. So a PKE scheme that can provide such, such security guarantee is that to have Receiver Select Opening Security, or ICO Security for short. So the standard semantic security is not enough to guarantee the ICO security. And there are many works constructing PKE schemes with ICO security in the literature. But in all these works, they only consider a single channel setting. That is, each public key can only use once to, in, to generate one channel of text. For the standard semantic security, such single channel security is already sufficient to imply the more realistic multi channel security. But it's unknown if such equivalence still holds for the ICO security. So, to solve this problem in this work, we formally study PKE schemes with ICO security in a multi channel setting. That is, each public key can be used multiple times to encrypt multiple uh, channel messages. And security do require that the those can't learn anything about the messages sent to the uncorrupted receivers. Our results mainly include four parts. First, we show that ICO security in the single channel setting does not imply ICO security in the multi channel setting by providing a constant example that is ICO secure with only one channel of text, but it's not secure even if the each public key are, only, are used to encrypt two channel messages. Then we give a lower bound on the security length for any PKE scheme with ICO security in the key channel setting, where K can be arbitrary polynomial. Most of our uh, negative results are based on the observation that if the number of possible secret keys for each user is less than the number of possible messages sent to the user, then the scheme can't be ICO secure. So on the personal tool side, we uh, give uh, we give constructions of PKE scheme uh, with ISO security in the multi-channel setting, 
by repeating some basic increment scheme for many times, which can help increase the number of possible secret keys. Our constructions include a general construction and a concrete construction. And in our second construction, we also use some additional techniques to reduce the secret length. So that's our main results. And for some reason, we are not able to cover full details about our results. And uh, please watch the long talk on YouTube or read our full paper if you are interested. That's all. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, is there any questions? OK, so I have a question. So um, as I understand, your impossibility results is in the non-programmable random oracle model. That the results yes. hold in the model? Sorry? Can you extend the results to to other models? Uh, yes. Uh, we can uh, we can have uh, the impossible results in the uh, uh, standard model, but uh, we, we still require that both the dual three and the simulator uh, have some uh, common of three input. So this is uh, not the standard model yet. So we have two results. One is uh, from the non-program uh, random oracle model, and the second is in the auxiliary input model. Okay, I see. So uh, I have another question. So uh, your second construction seems to be a DDH space construction, right? And uh, yeah. it has very good uh, secret key length. How about the cipher test length? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, the surface text uh, length is uh, linear in the number uh, in, in the k that is the number of challenges. So it's uh, an important. Uh, I think it's an important open question to reduce such uh, dependence on the k. So uh, it's an interesting open problem to construct a SO QPK scheme with uh, optimal secret length and the constant sub uh, tag size. Okay, I, I see. Okay. okay, thank you. So uh, is there any other questions from the audience? If no, so we, we move to the next talk and uh, can ask questions at the end of the sessions. Okay, so uh, the next paper in the session is, um, the title Security Reductions for White Box Key Storage in Mobile Payments by Estuardo Ambires Block, Chris Bruska, Mark Fischling, Kristen Jansen, and Win Michians. And the speaker is Estuardo. Are you ready, Estuardo? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for your introduction and for introducing also my co authors. So, on this work, uh, we focus on the white box attack scenario. And in this attack scenario, we consider software implementations of cryptographic algorithms, and we consider an adversary that gets access to the implementation code of the algorithm and who's also controlling the execution environment uh, and where this algorithm is running. So the adversary can inspect the code, uh, collect input and outputs um, pairs, and he can uh, modify the code as well, and pretty much do anything he wants with it. And in white box cryptography, we aim to implement cryptographic algorithms in such way that they remain secure even in the presence of such adversaries. And so in this work, we focus on the use case of white box crypto for mobile payment applications. And so mobile payment applications, uh, they serve the same purpose as traditional credit cards. So what they do is they, they store some user specific keys in encrypted form. And then whenever I want to perform a payment on a payment terminal, I need to decrypt or, and recover one of these limited use keys that they're called. And then when I have recovered it, I can use it for generating a, a transaction request message. And this uh, sort of authenticates me because uh, the, the, use, the key is user specific. And so we usually white box uh, this decryption program together with the program that we use for generating the transaction request message. And we use white box because we um, assume there might be an adversary in the form of malware present who's trying to extract uh, one of these LUKs or recover it and then use it for his own purposes. And so uh, we also consider the fact that the adversary might be able to simply copy the complete application with the encrypted LUKs, and then uh, just use the copy of this application on any device of his choice for making any payment he wants. And yeah, so such attacks are known as code lifting attacks and they also represent a serious threat uh, in the white box attack scenario. 
So in this in this paper, we um, consider the use uh, the the property of uh, hardware binding as a means to mitigate such code lifting attacks, and we put forward two security notions that capture this um, this uh, uh, so, so, sorry that that, that, that capture this um, uh, property. And so we define a, a white box key derivation function with hardware binding, and we uh, and we define the security for it, and we present um, a construction for it. And then later in the paper, we explain how we can use this white box KDF um, as a building block of a mobile payment application, and 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 then also define security for this mobile payment application and present a construction of it. And so, um, just to explain quickly how we define uh, or, or how we our white box KDF is defined. So we assume that the device where the white box program is going to be running has some sec some uh, secure hardware with some secret key material, and then whenever we want to compile a program, <clears throat> we query this hardware with a label which identifies the program we want to compile, and then based on this label and the secret key, we generate a sub key. And then the sub key is communicated securely to the entity that is going to compile our white box program. So our white box program is compiled based on a secret key K and on this secret key, secret sub key. And then we obtain, uh, in this case, a white box KDF, which is functional equivalent to, to a traditional KDF on this key K. Um, and so once we have this white box KDF, we give it to the user. And whenever he wants to, to run it, he queries the hardware with the context value he wants to use for generating the subkey uh, and with the label which identifies the program. And then the hardware is going to generate um, a response based on the label and the context and based on, on its uh, hardware main key. Then it, it returns the label to the, to the white box KDF. And then the white box KDF tries to recalculate this, um, this uh, or it checks for the valid validity of this response. And if it goes through, then it generates this uh, sub key. And so security is defined uh, in, in a model where we give the adversary the white box KDF. And then we also give him access to a hardware Oracle, uh, which, he, which generates responses so that he can uh, use, uh, like he can, he can experiment with the white box KDF and, and compute, uh, ge generate sub keys. And then in the main part of the game, he plays an indistinguishability um, game where he needs to distinguish between a key generated uh, completely at random or a key which is derived from the KDF itself. And then uh, in the paper, we present a construction uh, which is based on punctual PRFs and indistinguishability obfuscation. And we prove security via the puncture programs approach uh, from Zaha and Waters. And so here on the left side, you can see the, the operation flow of the white box KDF. So you see this check function tries to recalculate or checks the validity of the Sigma. And then if it goes through, um, it it runs the KDF, uh, yeah. And on the right side, you see uh, you see uh, how the circuit which corresponds to the white box KDF is defined. And as you can see, it co it corresponds of PRGs and PPRFs, yeah. And then uh, in our construction, what we do is we apply I/O to this circuit, and then yeah, we prove security. And so with this, I thank you for your attention, and I leave here this picture where we show how the white box KDF is integrated in our in our payment application. And yeah, and sorry, in the, yeah, in, in the middle of the presentation, I noticed I didn't put my camera on, so. I'm... Okay, uh, we have a time for questions. Uh, yeah. Only I see no questions uh, in the Zoom chat and also in the uh, IAC chat stream. Anyway, I have a, one question. So uh, it seems that you, you make an assumption about secure hardware that uh, for securely storing the master key, right? How reliable is this uh, assumption in practice? Yes, so in practice, um, it will depend a bit on, on the use case we're giving uh, to white box. But for instance, um, when we talk about Android phones, uh, we can assume for instance that uh, all Android phones have uh, an Android key storage. And, and then this Android key store um, it's either hardware based or it's based uh, on, on the trusted execution environment, which is also um, a part of the, of the operating system that is difficult to access. Um, so, so if we assume that from this key, key store, we can generate a um, simple operation like the response that we generate in, in our, in our um, scheme here, um, then we can say that this, this assumption is, is, is quite general in this case, uh, but it's going to depend on the, on the device itself. It's going to depend uh, how, um, 
like how strong this hardware actually is or how difficult it is for the adversary to access this hardware. So in the best case, it's going to be like actual hardware, hardware, and then the white box adversary cannot access it. And in a less good case, it's it's going to be um, not really hardware, but just a more difficult environment for the adversary to access. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another another question is that uh, you have an, a construction base on I/O. Uh, can you comment on the possibility of making it uh, practical? Uh, yeah. So, on, so unfortunately, for for the so for the paper, we just wanted to to have a something that we could prove that was, uh, you know, that that we that we could prove that it was secure, and I O was the best um, like the best obfuscation technique that we could uh, come up with for uh, achieving the security here, um, and and so so yeah so so this construction or this result we present is still far from from practical. Uh, but however, the, the uh, roadmap of our design can be pretty much applied to real life implementations. Uh, like for instance, so if you, if you want to implement hardware binding, you can follow, you can follow our construction um, roadmap and then, but then maybe, but then probably substitute uh, the PPRFs by more efficient PRFs, like maybe, maybe use AES for instance. And then instead of using I/O, use uh, some more efficient uh, or more practical um, obfuscation technique in this case. But yeah, unfortunately, we we don't know yet uh, a more efficient way of of having a provable secure uh, construction of this white box KDF for the or the payment application. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for the talk. Uh, Thank you. If there's no other questions, so probably we move to the, the last talk of the session. Okay, so the paper title is Circular Security is Complete for KDM Security by uh, Fuyuki Kitagawa and Takahiro Masuda. And Takahiro will give a talk. Uh, Takahiro, please. Yes. Uh, when you are ready. Okay. Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, thank you for introduction. I'm Takahiro Masuda from ICE. And this is a joint work with Fuyuki Kitagawa from NTT Secure Platform Laboratories. Key dependent message security or KDM security ensures that messages dependent on secret key can be securely encrypted. And it has applications such as hard disk encryption, anonymous credentials, FAG, and so on. So let me briefly recall how it's formalized. It is uh, parameterized by a function class F. And uh, in the F KDM CPA security experiment, an adversary is given multiple public keys, in this case N and has access to KDM encryption oracle, which returns uh, either an encryption of F of secret keys or an encryption of zero, depending on the challenge bit. Um, under any uh, index J and any function F in the class F. And PKE is said to be F KDM CPA secure in the N key setting if for any PPT adversary A, its advantage is negligible. And we define uh, FKDM CCS security similarly by allowing has access to the uh, allowing an adversary has access to the decryption oracle. So uh, the projection KDM security is uh, one of the most uh, widely studied uh, KDM security notions. Recall that uh, projection functions are functions, simple functions such that each output bit depends on at most a single input bit. So uh, projection KDM security allows us to securely encrypt only copy and negation of secret key bits. It sounds uh, somewhat weak, but it's known to be complete for KDM security in the following sense. Uh, projection KDM secure PKE scheme uh, can be generically transformed into bounded KDM uh, secure PKE scheme, where bounded KDM security means that it can securely encrypt uh, F of SK for any uh, F described by any circuit of a priori bounded polynomial size. And a proven result uh, holds uh, in any combination of uh, the settings, such as CPA security in the NK setting uh, scheme uh, is used, then we obtain uh, the same type of KDM security and also for the CCA. And his result also for, holds for the SKE. And here note that this bounded KDM security is uh, one of the strongest forms of KDM security. 
And in this work, we ask, can we establish a similar completeness for uh, of circular security? Uh, it is a, a security notion in which we can securely encrypt only a copy of secret key bits. So it is weaker than projection KDM security. And in some sense, it is the weakest form of KDM security. And as the titles of our work suggest, uh, our answer is yes. And we in this work, we show that we can construct any uh, bounded KDM CC, uh, sorry, uh, we can construct a bounded KDM CCS PKE in the N key setting from uh, any circular secure, C, circular CPS PKE in the N key setting. And note that this is a stronger completeness result for KDM security than the upper bounds, since we start from circular security, which is weaker than projection KDM security. And our results uh, uh, can be similarly established for SKE. So this is our main result. And in the remaining uh, slide, I explained the technical overview. First, I explained the uh, single key setting. Thanks to the existing works, uh, to achieve bounded KDM CCA secure PK in the one key setting, we only need to construct a so-called targeted encryption, which is a special form of public encryption formalized by Barak et al. And uh, as the main technical step, we show how to construct a targeted encryption from circular CPA secure encryption scheme in the single key setting. This is, I think, the most interesting part uh, in our work, and we use some uh, weak leakage uh, regimes of public encryption. For the details, please see our uh, video by uh, talked by Fuyuki, or uh, for full details for our please see our paper. Oh, by the way, uh, since the bounded KDM CPA secure PKE scheme implies in CCA secure PKE and reusable DV NISC for any NP languages. We also obtain these primitives from the CPA PKE. For the multi key setting, uh, we don't have a general uh, transformation from KDM CPA to KDM CCA yet. So, uh, as the first step, we show a transformation of uh, circular CPA PKE into what we call conformed targeted encryption, which is a new notion and is an extension of targeted encryption with weak form of circular security. For the details, please see our paper. Then we combine this primitive with GABL circuits in CCA PKE, reusable DV NISX, which are all implied by this uh, circular CPA PKE to construct a bounded KDM CCA PKE in the N key setting. Here we combine and extend the construction ideas from Barak et al. in 2010 and uh, the work uh, by our, ourselves in uh, nine, uh, 2019. And this is the last slide. We, this is our main result. This is our technical, main technical results, and these are corollaries. Thank you for your attention and ask any questions. Thank you, Tahiro. Um, so currently, again, we don't have no uh, questions. So I have uh, just one uh, simple question. Yes. So uh, um, I'm wondering whether we uh, currently know any concrete example of an encryption scheme that is circularly secure, but uh, is not KDM secure under projection. Yeah, that's a very uh, good question. And we don't have any uh, concrete scheme yet. And But uh, we know, uh, Fuyuki and I noticed that uh, we can at least construct a very artificial scheme. Oh, sorry. Uh, we can consider the black box separation, uh, which uh, shows in which uh, we construct a PK scheme, which is Circular secure, but not projection KDM secure. But it's uh, it's only uh, hold in the black box uh, security proof. So uh, it, I don't think it's a convincing example. And from the concrete assumptions such as CDH or factoring or LPA and LW, we don't have any scheme which is circular secure, but not projection KDM secure. I see, thank you. Um... So we still have around 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, so probably we can have the um, Q&A session for all of the sick authors, six speakers of the sessions, and we will come questions to all of the speakers from the audience. So I may have a question for Patrick. 
Yes. Okay, so uh, in your consciousness, uh, I mean, in your model, uh, it seems that you assume some interactive protocol between the user and uh, some um, certification authority, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so is there any way for the user to verify the randomness uh, from the, the CA? Ah, verify that the CA has enough randomness. Uh, no, that is not possible. But she can at least like protect herself uh, like she can protect her secret key against the CA if the CA doesn't have enough randomness. Like if she has enough randomness, right? It's like she knows that if she has enough randomness, then the CA has no information about the secret key. But then she would not be guaranteed that her computer, for instance, didn't select specific primes or, or like didn't try to influence the key generation in some manner. So she really has to trust that the CA has enough uh, randomness. For this, for this latter property. I see. Thank you. There is one question uh, for Estuardo. That's the last, uh, the the second last square paper. Yes. So the question is, what is the role of PRG in the first line of algorithm C? Is it not sufficient that if sigma equal to PBRF, comma? <coughs> Uh, yes, so so we use that for the the proof uh, later. Then uh, so when when we apply indistinguishability obfuscation, there uh, we want to show at some point that there is no way that uh, this operation is going to to be valid, and then um, um, and then that that for the program that we obfuscate, that it is at the same time functional equivalent to the original pro program where we're running the the PPRFs. Uh, without any punctured keys uh, to this program where this first first line does not go through. And we, we do this with this trick that was introduced by Sahai and Waters uh, by using the, PP, uh, the, the, the PRGs, um, where then later, instead of recalculating the PRG on the right side, we just hard code the, the value that uh, should be the PRG value. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I explained it a bit more in detail uh, in the in the video, actually. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it was clear what what I how I said it now. Yeah, thanks, Edward. <clears throat> okay. I have a question to Valerio. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, can you? Uh, uh, provide a little bit more detail about the parameter error uh, in your construction. I mean, the, the number of repetition of the random of the encryption algorithm uh, in the asymptotic sense and in the um, and with respect to practical parameters, like uh, for, so, for for the code base and logic base scheme in the NIST competition. So, uh, what are the concrete values of error? Of error, so we were um, we were trying to achieve negligible correctness error, which uh, and with that by mean we meant uh, two to the minus one twenty eight, and to achieve that uh, we needed uh, between three on or up to five repetitions depending on the on the concrete submission that we analyze. So the CPA submissions had uh, between. To the minus 40 and, and to the minus 30 decryption error. And I mean, in the, so in the asymptotic setting, setting, our compiler does not perform better than the dual compiler. But in the concrete one, then there we need uh, one less uh, parallel repetition than the dual compiler. And this can make the, our compiler perform better than the. CC version of some of the submissions to the MIS post quantum competition. I see. Thank you. So, if there is no further questions, so probably we can end this session a little bit earlier than the schedule. Willie, really, what do you think? Yes. So, if there is no more question. There is no more question in the chat as well.